Hello class, welcome to chapter 2, continuity. Uh, plainly speaking, if you had an unbroken curve, then you can say that it's continuous. That implies continuity. Now, if I were to define this uh, in, in math, then I would say the function f of x is continuous at c using the limit notation. Okay. So let me write that here. The function f of x is continuous at c, c is some point, if limit f of x as x approaches c, you know how that's usually equal to L, right, capital L? We're saying that should be equal to the function value, f of c. So at c, the function must be defined. That means there will be no holes at that point, and you will actually see the uh, function is continuous with the uh, either the continuous stretch of the graph or it's indicated by a solid dot. So that is what this actually tells us. And um, here again, just like the limit uh, situation, if your uh, graph really is, uh, is you know, if it, if it goes um, indefinitely on both ends, then you can have this continuity at every point. Uh, but if you have your graph kind of starting and ending, then you can have that the graph uh, with just one-sided limits. Therefore, there will be also one-sided continuity. Okay. So let me give you a, a graph to kind of help us uh, understand this better. So in this graph, you can see that we have uh, the graph running from A to B, and we are intentionally keeping it limited so it's not going indefinitely on both ends. So what we see is that in um, at point at A, right? If you check the continuity at A, you can see that you you can approach this limit from the right, but you don't have something from the left, and so that's the end. And likewise at B, you can approach the limit. Um, from the left but not from the right. But then if you look at the C value, if you look at C then you can approach the same limiting value from the left and from the right. And what you notice is throughout you have these solid dots, meaning there are no open circles to indicate a gap in your, um, in your function. So if we choose any point C, um, if, we, if we want to call the function continuous, then we should be able to approach that point from both the left and from the right, and that value must be equal to f of c. So this is, because it's part of the function, that c value should be plugged in to get the corresponding y value. Okay. Now if we look at a, a has one-sided uh, continuity. So because we are approaching from the right, we will have right continuous, this is right continuous. at a. That means if you took the limit f of x as x approaches a from the right, so a plus, that will give us f of a. And here for b, that will be left continuous, so it's one-sided, at b, which can be written as limit f of x as x approaches b from the left, so a minus, will be f of b, because it's the function at that value b, right? So that is the general idea. And of course, two-sided continuity would indicate this definition we have up here. So I'm going to present to you a formal definition with uh, the, the meaning of interior point and end point. So uh, again, you can see what it literally means. End points, in this case, in this example, would be a and b. And the interior point is any point that is between A and B because uh, the, the function between A and B, the blue graph, the function between A and B is continuous. So any value between A and B would be the interior of A and B. And so uh, the definition would uh, talk about uh, the interior points because we know that at the end points at A and B, it is not uh, two-sided continuity, it's a one-sided continuity. So if we want to talk about two-sided continuity, it is assured within A and B, so the interior values of uh, the interval A to B. 
So here's the definition and let me read it. Interior point. If a function y equals f of x is continuous at an interior point c of its domain, if limit f of x, x approaches c is f of c. I wrote that right up here, right? Let's see that they use the language more formally using the bringing in the interior point. End point. A function y equals f of x is continuous at a left end point A or is continuous at a right end point B of its domain if limit f of x as x approaches A plus is f of A or limit f of x as x approaches B minus equals f of B respectively. So remember again that when you get the idea of the concept, you also have to expose yourself to the formal definition and that's the reason why I bring that in and I read it to you so that you'll get used to this format, this kind of language, because a, a formal definition kind of covers all the base and provides us the premise, the background for uh, the, the theorem or the definition to work. And so uh, sometimes, you know, you'll have uh, to just understand from the definition. And uh, when you have a problem given to you and, you've in, and it's, uh, it requires critical thinking, the only way to understand is to fall back on the definition. So I'd like you to develop this uh, sense of uh, reading definitions. Don't skip them because you see that it's wordy. But learn to read them so that you understand the premise uh, for which this will work. Now along those lines, we have a definition for the continuity test. So we said if it's an unbroken curve, it is continuous. But uh, you know, that is too sim simplistic. So we really need to know mathematically, how do you know that a function is continuous? So here is the definition, and the definition comes with these three pointers. Let's read through it. A function f of x is continuous at an interior point, x equals c, of its domain, if and only if it meets the following three conditions. That f of c exists, meaning c lies in the domain of f. Limit f of x as x approaches c exists, meaning the function has a limit at x, x approaches c. And thirdly, the first two conditions must be equal to each other. So limit of f of x as x approaches c must be equal to f of c. The limit must be equal to the function value. Previously, we said we, we are not worried about the open circle. That's okay. We're only trying to see how close it gets to that value and what value it points to for the limit. So we, we didn't really mind about the open circle. And that is true with limits for functions. But when we talk about continuity, we are kind of upgrading it to a situation where we want the function value to match with the limit. And that way we can assure or use limits to define continuity or continuous functions. And uh, as you can see, we have these three conditions that must be met for a function to be continuous in its domain. So that's, that's again an important language there. It says domain because, you know, you can't just look outside the domain and say, oh, it's not continuous, right? A good example would be the the rational function one uh, one over x. Let me say y equals one over x, right? If you see there is a discontinuity, right? There's a break at zero. So if we look at it like that, then we'll say, oh, it is not continuous because there is a break there. But if you look at it, look at the definition closely, it says it is continuous at an interior point of its domain. So if you look at this, the domain itself says. We can go from negative infinity to zero, union zero to infinity. This is the domain for this rational function. So in its domain, it is continuous because the domain eliminates zero already. Because when, if you look at the fraction, when x takes the value zero, one over zero makes it undefined. So it, uh, the, the domain is what makes the function defined. So it automatically will eliminate things that make it undefined and therefore for this rational function over its domain, it is continuous. So don't just go by the visual and say, oh, you said unbroken curve. So this is broken. The curves are, I see two curves. So you can't um, argue that way because the definition made it very clear for us about the role of the domain. Okay. Okay. Now in the following examples, what I plan to do is give you uh, some graphs where our focus will be on uh, an interior point, x equals 0, right? Because I'm trying to go by the definition here. And so I want to see um, a function f of x is continuous at an interior point. We're talking about continuity at a point. 
Later on, we'll be talking about continuity for the entire function. But if you think of it intuitively, if it is continuous at every point on the graph, that means it's continuous everywhere for the entire function, right? So we start off by looking at continuity at a point. Do we, can we approach uh, from both sides with a limit? And in particular, does that limit value actually match with the function value? Because if it approaches, uh, if the limit uh, exists from both sides, we simply say the limit exists. We did not talk about the continuity, but if it is matching with a function value, then we upgrade it and call it a continuous function. So uh, let's take a look at this example. And uh, as I mentioned, we'll be focusing on interior point x equals 0. So in this first uh, graph, we have when it's x when x is equal to zero, um, there is a hole, right? When we consider zero, in the second graph there is a hole, but there is a solid dot there. So let's think about this, uh, and and consider the three conditions. So condition one, let's see if that works. F of c exists. Does so c must lie in the domain of f? Is zero in the domain of f? C, uh, I'm sorry, not C here, 0. 0 lies in the domain of F in the second graph. In the first graph, 0 has a hole, right? So there is a break there, which means the domain would be negative infinity up to 0, union 0 to positive infinity with a break at 0. So the domain will eliminate the zero for the first one. But for the second one, the zero is part of the domain because I see a solid dot at two for the zero. So when we look at uh, zero, we see that it's defined at two. So the first one did not me meet that condition. So right there, continuity fails for the first graph. Okay. Uh, now, even if one condition fails, you know, it, it, the test fails, you know that. So all three must be satisfied. So then I look at the second condition, which says the limit must exist. Okay. Now the first one failed, so you, it's it's really not re required for us to continue with the test. But for the sake of illustration, I want to use that as well. So if you look at it from the left and from the right, do they both point to the same limiting value? Yes, the same value is one. The same is true with this uh, graph too, because you know this is, I would call this. Uh, you know, con uh, discontinuity situation, and this one it will be called removable discontinuity. Now, if you recall um, stuff you learned in in intermediate algebra, when there is a hole. What we did was we used piecewise function to fill that hole, you're right, cementing that gap by assigning uh, another point for that hole so that the domain is continuous. So, so, so the second graph actually goes all the way from negative infinity to infinity. Even though there is a hole there, that hole is kind of filled at a different point on that same zero. So along the y-axis, we found some other point. We could have chosen 1.5. We could have chosen... 0.7, any any number other than that hole where the where it occurs at one, anywhere other than one on the y-axis, we could have chosen a point and used that to fill that hole to make the domain defined for all real numbers. That's why we call it the removable discontinuity. Okay. Now, um, or you can actually fill the hole right there and use the piecewise function to separately define a point at one, and so it's like two pieces but they both merge and gives you that one continuous graph. All right, so a uh, limit exists. Yes, we know that um, the second condition is true. What about the third condition? Does the limit equal the function? Now for the first one, yes, uh, we saw that it's, uh, it's not defined at zero, so that's not gonna work. But for the second graph, we have the limit of f of x as x approaches 0 to be 1, but, oops, not another point. We found that the f function, the function f, f of 0, actually pointed to the 2. 
So you see that there was no match. So there was a mismatch there. So this is a case of discontinuity where the test works in, in one or two conditions but fails in the third condition, right? So, so discontinuity meaning just a hole or a hole with another uh, solid dot to fill that are called removable discontinuity. Okay. So here's the next example. Here we have, um, again, our focus is zero, right? The interior point is x equals zero. Write the x properly. Now, um, you clearly see that as we approach zero from the left and from the right, there are two pieces, two separate pieces, and they are showing uh, uh, limits at different values. So if I took the first condition, is zero, is, is, uh, does zero lie in the domain? And we say, yes, zero lies in the domain because even though there is a hole here, it is compensated by the solid dot here. So it seems like all the values on the, on the domain are defined. So if you look at the blue, leftmost end of the blue to the rightmost end of the blue, there were no gaps, meaning all the values were defined. Okay. Now, if at one also we had an open circle, that means we have a discontinuity at zero and it fails in point one. So I will say f of zero exists. So C lies in the domain of F. Two. Does limit F of zero, I'm um, so, uh, sorry, limit F of X as X approaches zero exist? So limit F of X as X approaches zero. So we that means you approach from the left and the right and they must give you the same, same limit. That doesn't happen. Actually, the left-hand limit as you approach zero from the left, that gives you the value zero on the y-axis and your limit of f of x as x approaches 0 from the right gives you a 1. Together, you know that the limit does not exist. So it fails in the second condition completely. We don't have to go to the third condition. Nevertheless, we'll check the third condition. Even if the third condition holds true, it still has failed because the second condition did not hold true. All right, the third condition would be um, this limit f of x as x approaches 0 must be equal to f of 0. Now f of 0 would be the 1 because that is what we have. Now only the, the right side limit has a 1. Together the limit here does not exist. And this one is a 1, so they are not the same. So this one fails because it is a jump discontinuity. That's the name for it. It jumps, right, at 0. So we call it jump discontinuity. We'll take a look at the third example. Once again, uh, we're talking about what happens in the, at the interior point zero. So uh, this clearly is a rational function, one over x squared. And uh, let's again test the three conditions. Now, um, is zero part of the domain? <laughs> right there, that fails. So f of zero does not exist. I'll just say DNE. So it fails right there. But uh, if you went for the second one, you see that limit f of x as x approaches zero from the left you see that the blue graph actually approaches infinity, right? And limit f of x as x approaches 0 from the right. That also, right, as we approach 0 from the right, the left also pointed to infinity. So together, they gave us the same, uh, uh, the same value. So limit f of x as x approaches 0 exists in the sense that they both give us the same value, even though infinity itself is not a value, they are pointed in the same direction. And three would be, um, does the limit f of x as x approaches zero, is that equal to f of zero? Now, this gave us infinity, but f of zero is undefined, so we lost it there. So to avoid all this confusion and how do I interpret this, you just uh, stop right when you have your first condition uh, that goes off. 
okay so if the if your very first uh, condition goes off just stop right there if it is your second condition where it doesn't work stop right there so wherever you first encounter a problem uh, you can stop right there <laughs> okay so this is called infinite discontinuity Now this is a is a problem only because we chose zero, right? Zero is naturally not part of the domain, so we went after a value that was not a domain. So right there, that's the reason why this doesn't this fails. But if you look at it in in entirety, because zero is not part of the domain, all other values will work, and so that will keep the function continuous. But for the sake of this interior point C equals zero, where zero is not part of the domain, we have that infinite discontinuity. And the last example here, we've seen this before. Uh, we will uh, re we recall that y equals sine one over x kind of oscillates rapidly up and down, right? So so basically, it it it, it oscillates too much near zero. So you really cannot see what's happening at zero because you really will not have that view. So right there, you have this dismissed you know you can't really tell if it's continuous or not at, at least at zero so we call this oscillating discontinuity so we always want to use the uh, the three conditions for the continuity test to verify if uh, we are looking at a particular interior point and see if it is continuous at that point now let's take a look at the properties of continuous function. Uh, we have the premise given to us. It says, if the functions f and g are continuous at x equals c, then the following combinations are also continuous at x equals c. So f is continuous at c and g is continuous, continuous at c. Remember, these are two different functions. You have two different graphs running, and they're continuous at c. So what they're saying is, we can then add the two functions or subtract, do the constant multiple, multiply them, divide them, take the power and take the root. All these are supported by, um, by the limit laws, basically. So that is what uh, we use to support this. Okay? So if, um, if, if your limits, are, if, if those three conditions are satisfied for f and g individually, then these uh, conditions are also going to work. Now, we also have additional uh, rules that go with it for uh, specific cases like if you had a polynomial, is it continuous? If you have a rational, is it continuous? So, we're going to do that as well. When we talk about the composite functions, composite of continuous functions, it says if f is continuous at c and g is continuous at f of c, then the composite g circle f is continuous at c. Let's focus on that for a moment, okay? Now, if you recall, f circle g was written as f of g of x, where you compose g inside f. So what we did was we usually plugged in the function g inside the function f, right? That's composition. And if it's d circle f, that's going to be g of f of x. g uh, is the function inside which f of x is plugged in. So the order matters because what goes inside what, right? And so we're saying if f is continuous and g is continuous, then their composition will also be continuous. And all this is happening at c, at a particular point. So it's not for x, but it's for some c, okay? So if I were to modify this, it's just like saying f of g of some point c is f of g of c, right? And it's for that point that uh, it's going to be continuous in the composite form. And uh, this is true provided f and g are each continuous at, um, uh, meaning f is continuous at c and g is continuous at f of c, okay, because one is inside the other. So the order here matters. Okay. So f is continuous at c and g is continuous at f of c. So if you want to see this, um, you know, in a linear fashion, 
let's say this is a point C. And this point will be F of C. And this point is G of F of C. Okay. So what we are saying, if you go back to the definition, it says F is continuous at C. Okay. Let's think of uh, this arch that helps us to make the connection. Oops, that's bad. It goes from here to here. That means F is continuous at C, right? Because it's F of C. And then we are saying, let's go back here, G is continuous at F of C. That means G is defined at F of C. So from here, you go to this. So you say G is continuous at, at F of C. That's how you can write G of F of C. Does that make sense? F is continuous at C means F of C, right? Because the function, if it's continuous, it takes the, it matches with the function value. And what we're saying is this theorem tells us if this is true, then the composite G circle F is continuous at C, meaning you are bypassing this middle step and you're going all the way from C to, oops, to here. And that will be saying G circle F because G circle F is G of F of C as I illustrated before. So that is what the theorem does. The theorem really helps you to bridge that connection from C all the way to G of F of C, which is a composition of two functions. And we're saying the composites of continuous functions are continuous. That's what it, this means. Now, what does the second one mean? It says limits of continuous function. So this is interesting. If G is continuous at the point B and limit of F of X as X approaches C equals B, then the rule is this. Okay. So technically, what they're telling us is if you took the limit of okay, G of F of X, as x approaches c, it looks as if all they're doing is they are switching the limit and the, the oops. they're switching the limit and the g. So when you do that switch, what happens is the g comes out and the limit goes inside. x approaches c, f of x. But we are told we are defi it's defined in the in the in the definition here that limit f of x as x approaches c is equal to b. So that means this whole thing here is b, which is the same as saying this is equal to g of b. So you have these two uh, theorems or these two definitions that teach you that uh, continue that uh, composite functions are continuous and there is a way we can deal with limits of continuous functions okay, that are composite in nature. So going back here, we have these seven conditions and we have these two. And uh, we also have other conditions. So let's write those down. Okay. So uh, if, I, if I were to, let me just number this, okay? Seven, so that will be like eight. This will be like 9, just to account for them. So condition number 10, or rather I should say properties. Uh, property number 10 would be that polynomials are continuous functions. We know this from algebra, right? Polynomials, they vary by degree. So polynomial of degree 1 is a linear function. Polynomial of degree 2 is a quadratic function polynomial of degree 3 is a um, chair or cubic function. So we have all these functions and they don't have any gaps, any uh, breaks. They are continuous from end to end. So they are fine there. And 11 says no. rational. No. Rational functions are also continuous. And they are continuous in their domain. That's very important. This dom domain is where it's defined. 
and then we have absolute value absolute value functions are continuous then we have uh, trigonometric functions are continuous again it all has to work over its domain right in their domain so quite obviously they do have places where they become undefined not a problem with sine and cosine because they are continuous functions throughout they have no restrictions because it's true for all real numbers but uh, tangent cotangent secant and cosecant these have asymptotes remember so these uh, uh, asymptotes uh, indicate that the denominator became zero at those points meaning the function became undefined so where the denominator uh, has takes the value zero or in other words if the function becomes undefined you will see these asymptotes those are points where there will be discontinuities so remember that if you are focusing on points that are not part of the domain you will encounter trigonometric functions being in discontinuous so please bear that in mind when we um, consider the continuity the continuity works only in their domain then we have um, identity functions this is trivial because it is actually um, like a polynomial function of degree one so I just said uh, identity uh, functions are continuous what are identity functions these are nothing but f of x equals x meaning the identity isn't lost when x takes the value 1 f of x meaning f of 1 is also 1 when x is negative 1 f of negative 1 is also negative 1 when x is 0 f of 0 is also 0 so you notice that if you were to draw the table to get your x and y values you see that they are the same the identity is not uh, is preserved so we call them the identity function and then we um, saw previously too the algebraic combination of continuous functions is also continuous so these functions must be continuous to begin with And that is what we saw in the uh, top uh, properties right so this is like a summation of of uh, what we saw in the beginning meaning when we say algebraic combinations we did the sum the difference the product the quotient so all those things are part of it okay uh, we'll take a look at an example now so the question says show that the following functions are continuous on their natural domains and we'll start with the first one y equals square root of x squared minus 2x minus 5. So in order to answer this, you need to first figure out what the domain is. Okay? The domain is because of the square root. Uh, the, the, the square root function is continuous only from 0 to infinity, right? because that's how it is. And uh, because it's a root of a continuous, um, so it's, it's actually an identity function, uh, the root of an identity function. So let me just write the description here square root function this is a square root of x we're talking about square root of x that uh, has a domain 0 to infinity right then what we see is this um, radicand the, val the expression under the radical sign is a polynomial function x squared minus 2x minus 5 and this is good for all domains I mean all uh, real numbers sorry all real numbers negative infinity to infinity and now what we need to understand here is that um, the square root function is square root of x but x itself is an identity function right so I know we have a lot of uh, conditions we saw Identi identity function is f of x is equal to x the function itself is x so if you take the square root of uh, and, and f of x is continuous right identity functions are continuous f of x equals x is continuous so if you take let's go back here quickly so if you talk about the roots 
if f is continuous, then its root is also continuous, right? And it's defined on an open interval containing c. So the root of a continuous function is also continuous. That's great. And that's the idea we're trying to emphasize here. So if I combine these two, the square root, right, instead of x, I replace it with x squared minus 2x minus 5, meaning in the place of x, I'm plugging in x squared minus 2x minus 5, which is basically the idea of composition. Composition of x squared minus 2x minus 5 in square root of x. And we just saw also that uh, if two functions are um, continuous, then the composition of those functions is also continuous. So, and all this is going to happen in their natural domain, right? So that is what we have here. So we kind of reason out by looking at all the combination of these of these properties, and then we say this implies that uh, y. equals square root of x squared minus 2x minus 5 is continuous in its natural domain. All right, now let's take a look at um, another one, b, x power 2, oh, let me write here y equals, x power 2 over 3 divided by 1 plus x power 4. Okay. All right, now we have to break this up. y equals x power 2 over 3 over 1 plus x power 4. Focus on the numerator. The numerator is nothing but the cube root of x squared, right? x squared is a polynomial function and the root of a polynomial function is, is continuous, so this is continuous. If you look at the denominator, 1 plus x power 4 is a polynomial, so that is continuous. So the numerator is continuous, the denominator is continuous. Nowhere does the denominator become 0 because no value of uh, x will make it 0, right, because of the power 4. So this implies... Um, f, so, so let, let's say this was, just for convenience, let's call this f, and let's call this g. That means f over g is also continuous by quotient property. And therefore, we can, uh, you know, collectively say that y equals x power 2 over 3 over 1 plus x power 4 is continuous in its domain. In this case, you know, it's really interesting because the domain for the numerator is negative infinity to infinity because uh, the cube root can accept negative values in the radicand, so no problem. But uh, if you look at it, x squared, so it's going to get squared, so you won't really get a negative radicand. So we got that. And uh, the denominator is a polynomial in particular. It uh, takes all real numbers uh, because uh, it, it's not going to be affected by any value to make it zero in the denominator. So because of the special condition, here the domain is everywhere, all real numbers. So totally fine. And uh, so the quotient comes out to be continuous. Okay. Part C is y equals absolute value of x minus 2 over x squared minus 2. So for this, just focus on what is inside the absolute value bars. So if you look at what is inside, the numerator, I'll just call it nr, is a polynomial, right? That means it's continuous. The denominator, dr, is also a polynomial, so it's continuous. So the fraction, numerator over denominator, a polynomial over a polynomial is basically a rational function, 
So you can see it as a rational and you know that is defined, uh, I mean that is continuous on its domain. So this is continuous everywhere, continuous everywhere. And um, together, if I, if I were to see this, this is uh, going to be continuous except when, so you'll have to see where the denominator becomes zero. For that, you have to set your denominator to zero. So x equals, x squared equals two, x equals plus or minus root two. So if x takes the value either plus or minus root two, we have a problem. So the domain has to eliminate these two values. So that's the natural domain for this. You know, if you actually go back to the, to the quotient condition, I know it's a long way back. Look at this, it's f over g provided g is not equal to zero. The denominator should not be zero, that's part of the domain. So that is what we are doing here too. So the, this is where the domain, so I'll have to say not equal to, because you don't want it to be equal to zero. Then. So we do not want in our domain, so this is a restriction in the domain. In the natural domain. It's a natural restriction because that is how uh, the quotients are, de are defined. All right, so now that you've got this, now we have, um, we have established that x squared, I mean x, right, x minus 2 over x squared minus 2 is continuous in its natural domain. And we have absolute value inside which it is. So it's like having an x there. We know absolute value functions are also continuous. So if you compose this inside this, composition of these two continuous functions will produce absolute value of x minus 2 over x squared minus 2, which is composition of functions. And we know that is continuous. So these problems really help you to think to see what are the valid ways in which I can use a combination of these properties to determine the continuity of these uh, functions on their natural domain. Okay. Uh, this is called continuous extension to a point. And I want to recall that we've seen this graph before. Y equals sine theta over theta. In fact, we use this uh, and then we said the limit of sine theta over theta as theta approaches zero is one, right? And but we see that there is that open circle there. And so the continuous extension to a point is that for this graph, it is continuous everywhere else except for that uh, value uh, against zero, right? And therefore, if we can fill that, and I discussed that under removable discontinuity, if we can fill that hole, okay, uh, then we can make it continuous. We can't just fill that hole because that will change the function, you know, it will um, not be still sine theta over theta. Now for this we use piecewise function, okay. So uh, what we're doing is, I'm showing this, uh, this area, uh, how do I show this? Um, it's like, it's like I'm zooming this area, okay, I'm the boxing it to kind of show you that that's a zoomed version. Now uh, the blue function is the original f of x. Okay, and the red function has the capital F of x, wherein my uh, function has been adjusted to have that hole filled with a solid dot. Okay, so what we do is we use piecewise function. To fill the gap. So I'll give you the general version for this. What we do is we create a new function, capital F of x, right, like the red one, it's a new function, wherein the uh, original function, sine theta over theta, let's call that F of x, right? That function is kept as it is, but you know that that function had uh, uh, zero as not part of its domain, right? So we'll just keep it in its domain. So if x is the domain, is in the domain, in the domain of f. So that will be the one with the hole. And then to fill the hole, you know where the hole is. The hole is at 0, 1, right? So if, if I could define another function, which is basically 1, then I can 
fill that for that one. So in general, it could be some some number, right? If it was, if the whole was happening at two, then it'll be two. If it was happening at seven point nine, it'll be seven point nine. So in general, I call it L, capital L, and that L will be if x is c, the place where you have the domain disconnecting, right? So for the sake of this problem, my capital F of x will be the small f of x, which is basically sine theta over theta. And this is, uh, what's the domain for this? The domain for this is negative infinity to 0, union 0 to infinity, because there was a break at 0. And the 0, where the break is, is compensated at 1. So the other piece will be 1, comma, um, x equals 0, because 0 is where you had the disconnect, right? So that will be where x is equal to 0. Here x is any number that belongs to this interval with a, uh, with a gap. So this is what we do so that when we fill it, okay, let me come back here. When we fill it and go back here, it has got two pieces where one piece was the blue function, the other piece was the pink dot. But together, if you see them in the piecewise function setup, it is a continuous function that is defined at zero as well. Okay. In fact, that zero becomes a function value um, at one, and therefore it helps you to see a complete uh, fulfillment of your uh, continuous test conditions. So all the conditions are fulfilled when you uh, utilize this um, this piecewise function format to provide an extension, a continuous extension for the function at that point. Right. Uh, in fact, this is also the situation where you'll you'll arrive at when you have a rational function and you reduce by canceling common factors, what happens is the rational function, which is supposed to appear in branches, will reduce to, say, a linear function or something with a hole. And so that can be overcome if you use the um, continuity or continuous extension of f. Uh, let's take a look at some of the problems involving trig functions. So let's find the limit of cosine 2x plus sine 3 pi over 2 plus x as uh, x approaches pi over 2. So now if you have a limit of cosine of a function, I want you to see it as limit cosine of a function. So that's something in x, cosine of, a, of, of, of some angle. Okay. So it's usually cosine of some function, right? So the function would be an angle. In this case, the angle is this function. So we know that the limit of uh, uh, composite functions, right? The limit of composite functions, <coughs> excuse me. So let me write here. Um, it's easier to understand it as a function like I wrote it in the beginning. Okay. So cosine of an angle in this case is a function, so it's nice to keep it that way. That, that property, limit of co um, composite functions, tells us we can switch the limit and the cosine. Okay. So what this allows us to do then is bring the cosine out and send the limit in. Because you can find cosine of a number but how do you find cosine of this expression? So that's where this property comes in handy. So then I'll quickly say this was the limit of composite functions. This was one of our uh, continuity properties, right? Okay, so now it's uh, a whole lot simpler because you just have to plug in for pi over 2. So 2 times, um, I'll just write parentheses for all the x's we have to substitute, and then I will plug in for the x value. And so here, 2x, right, so it has to be pi over 2. I'm applying the limit, and then this is 3 pi over 2, and this is going to be pi over 2. It's so important to know how the parentheses work, because then we know how they are grouped. The 2's here cancel off leaving us with pi plus 
sign. This is 3 pi over 2 plus pi over 2. They have the same denominator, so add them. That will be 4 pi over 2. I'm going to show that calculation here. That's going to be 4 pi over 2, which reduces to 2 pi. Okay. So then this becomes cosine pi plus sine 2 pi. Go to your unit circle from trigonometry, and if you find what sine 2 pi is, again, of course, keep it in radians, cosine of pi plus sine 2 pi is 0. That's equal to 0 from the unit circle. And so we come back here and say, okay, that's pi plus 0, which is basically cosine pi. And cosine pi, we know, is negative 1. That comes from the unit circle as well. And so we use trigonometry in these kind of problems as well. Right? Uh, how do you find uh, in the next problem? Limit of 3x over sine 11x as x approaches 0. You see the sine uh, uh, 11x and x approaches 0. You must be reminded of that particular, uh, uh, you know, rule we saw about sine theta over theta the limit of sine theta over theta as theta approaches zero is one try to use that here okay so how do i use it um, i have to have this is 3x on the top that's fine but i have to have sine 11x a matching 11x in the bottom right isn't it if I had a matching 11x in the bottom, then that would uh, give me, allow me to use this. But I can't just bring in 11x, so I multiply um, on the top with like 11x as well. Remember, all this is happening in the denominator, but I'm still learning to balance it off. Okay, so my my uh, hope is that I will use this separately and this separately. Okay, so clearly these x's cancel off. That gives me 3 over 11 that can be pulled out leaving me with limit x approaches 0 1 over sine 11 x over 11 x because they have to be matching theta and theta and now we are ready to apply the limit for the numerator and the denominator so this is 3 over 11 times limit of 1 as x approaches 0 over limit of sine x oh sorry 11 x over 11 x as x approaches 0 and we know from the property above that I just showed you this is going to be equal to 1 and the top limit of 1 as x approaches 0 there's no place to plug in for x as 0 so it's a constant so that is also equal to 1 so this actually is 3 over 11 times 1 over 1 which is basically 3 over 11 and that will be your answer for this problem we didn't really have to go into trigonometry we just used one of the properties from calculus itself to answer this. Okay, let's go for the next one. Find limit of 1 minus cosine 6x over 4x as x approaches 0. Again, this setup we've seen before. It's a question of recalling. And so what we saw was uh, limit h approaches 0. 1 minus um, cosine h over h is equal to 0. Okay. Now, um, so sometimes it can have the other effect also. So h approaches 0. It's, it could be cosine h minus 1 over h to be 0 also. Because after all, the order has changed. But you know that zero takes neither positive or negative, so we are not uh, going to see a change in the value in the answer here in this case. So it's, it could be appear in one of these forms. So we have that uh, order here. All right, uh, for this, again, the h's must match, right? The h on the top, h at the bottom, and h in the limit. So, um, so we have um, x as the common variable, so no problem there. Now I have the cosine 6x, I have to match it with the 6x in the bottom. And that again can be achieved if we 
did a little algebraic manipulation. So 1 minus cosine 6x. Remember, we uh, I showed you this technique where I separate them on the top and the bottom like this, so that I could insert the 6x that I desire up and down. Okay, And then this allows me to uh, basically cancel off these x's. Even the 6 and the 4, 6 is 3 and this is 2. It simplifies, right? So then I can pull the simplified 3 over 2 outside. And I'll have limit x approaches 0, 1 minus cosine 6x over 6x. Okay, it's matching. If you can't, if it matches, that's fine. But if you wanted to see it in terms of h, you can also say let h be equal to 6x. Okay, so that means 3 over 2, limit of h approaches 0, because x is now changed to h, 1 minus cosine h over h. And that is strikingly exactly the same as the formula itself but uh, that we saw is equal to zero so technically this is going to be three over two times zero which is zero so the answer on this one will be zero so the next one said find negative 5x plus 1 minus cosine x all over x then what you see here is that uh, we have that 1 minus cosine x over x situation partially but this negative 5x is in the way but that's not a problem because again algebra allows you to separate the fractions like this so i have this 1 minus cosine x over x separated from this and this in turn gives you x is cancelled off so then we all this is happening inside so then we can separate them by applying the limit to each individual term. So that's limit of negative 5x approaches 0 plus limit 1 minus cosine x over x as x approaches 0. And because this doesn't have any x, this comes back as negative 5. Because of the rule, this becomes 0. So to ultimately, you get negative 5 out of this. Now in our next problem. It is find limit cosine 2x, two, two say 2x, over 3, and that's the angle part, plus tan x over 2, and that's when x, x approaches pi over 2. And of course, this is all encased here. So here again, we can apply the limit directly and see what happens. So this implies we have cosine 2x over 3 plus tan x over 2. And remember, I'm putting in parentheses for the place of x so that I plug in correctly. You know, if, it, if they gave you a negative pi over 2, then remember to make sure that the sign is managed correctly and then you'll have to use the odd or the evenness of the function from trigonometry and we learned that cosine and secant are the only even functions which means they will absorb the minus and all other the other four functions sine tan um, cosecant and uh, cotangent the other four functions the trig functions will all be odd which means if if it has a negative angle the negative will go in front of the function so you have to recall all those concepts as well in here. All right, um, let's uh, solve this one. So the twos cancel off here. That gives us cosine pi over 3 plus tan. That's pi over 2 over 2, which means it's pi over 4. And now you can use your unit circle and come up with the answer. So uh, cosine pi over 3 will be a half plus tan pi over 4, tan 45 degrees is sine pi over 4 over cosine pi over 4 and you can see that uh, in the unit circle your uh, sine pi over 4 is root 2 over 2 so i'll just write that here root 2 over 2 over cosine which is root 2 over 2 and so that's going to be half plus 1 1 and a half which is 3 over 2 so that's how you apply so because trig itself was a separate study we did a semester of uh, trigonometry. Um, 
you know that you'll have to recall them so go, go back to your notes hold on to them and if uh, there are some steps that are missing in explanations or things like that you want to really go back to that trig lesson to refresh yourself on what they used what technique they used because at this point in uh, in calculus you will not be able to uh, you know, go back and teach all over <laughs> trigonometry it will definitely help you to make that connection and help I will ha definitely help help you to see like I showed you how tan pi over 4 is obtained as sine pi over 4 over cosine pi over 4 so we can do that but we're not going to you can't expect uh, to learn trigonometry at this time that will not be um, that that won't work okay so I really recommend that you go back and look at those notes and, um, and, and and then we will continue on. Now, when we talk about limits involving infinity, we, we understand that all the limit laws we saw, right, those properties and the laws, they're all true when we replace the limit uh, as x approaches c by limit x approaches infinity or uh, x approaches negative infinity, okay? So what we're saying is you can now expect to see x approaches infinity like this giving you giving you um, a, a value l or it could be limit f of x as x approaches negative infinity giving you a value l or we're saying we could also find functions x approaches c giving you infinity or limit f of x as x approaches c giving you a negative infinity. So you can find uh, infinity involved either as x approaches that or as a limit itself, you know, as a value. So what we do is we are now trying to accept these also as uh, results for finding limit. So let's take a look at some examples here. So we have to find the limit. Find or evaluate it, let's say, sometimes. First one is limit of pi plus 1 over x as x approaches infinity. Now, if this was our problem, now we're using the properties, right, the sum property, we can separate this as, uh, I'll write it in the next step because that's our problem. This implies limit 5 x approaches infinity plus limit 1 over x as x approaches infinity. Okay. Now, uh, because of the limit laws, we can actually uh, substitute for x as infinity. Now, what we notice is that when you substitute for x as infinity, you notice that the first one doesn't have any x. So this comes back as 5. And here, when I plug in for x as infinity, it's 1 over infinity, right? It sounds silly, but infinity is a very, very large number. Positive infinity is a very, very large number. So a very large number sitting in the denominator makes that fraction really, 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 really small. Okay? That's the analytical way of thinking. So that makes it really, really small. But I'll also give you another way to look at it. If it's 1 over infinity, Think of infinity is some number, right? Let's say a over zero. So because I don't want to keep some letter, I like to keep it as one over zero. It could be seven over zero, 10 over, 10,000 over zero. It doesn't matter what that number is. For simplicity, I'm, I'm going to understand that my infinity is like one over zero. Please understand that they are not equal, but I want you to see it that way so that you can reason out like this. So in the place of infinity, if I were to do the one over zero, you know, by um, you know, when you divide two fractions, you take the first fraction, the numerator times the flip of the denominator, right? So it's basically 0 over 1, which is 0. So you can see it analytically that as x, as infinity is, is a very, very large number, the fraction becomes very, very small. It's a very large number and the fraction becomes very small very small meaning zero. If you were to see it like what I just showed you, you can see that it actually brings comes down to a zero. So both ways help us to, to reason out as five plus zero, which is five. So that's the answer here. 
Let's try problem B. And x approaches negative infinity. So we have this expression, pi root 3 over x squared. Okay. Now remember again, you can use the, the properties, a combination of those properties, the limit laws. So if we approach in that direction, we see that the pi and the root 3 are constants. So we can pull out the pi and the root 3 out, leaving us with limit 1 over x squared as x approaches negative infinity. Yeah. So uh, this again, you can separate it out as limit x approaches neg negative infinity. I'm going to separate the 1 over x squared as 1 over x times. So I am separating it and applying limit individually. 1 over x. So you have those three terms, the constant and this and this. We just saw, right, we just saw here that limit 1 over x as x approaches infinity is 0. Now what about negative infinity? Negative infinity would, would, would have had the, the negative, right? Uh, maybe negative 1 over 0 is negative infinity. But it doesn't matter because 0 does not take positive or negative. So what we see here is that this actually comes down to 0 times 0. So all of this multiply out and that gives us 0. That's the answer for part B. Now, let's we, if we look at part C, we're asked to find the limit of 5x squared plus 8x minus 3 all over 3x squared plus 2 as x approaches infinity. If you applied infinity everywhere, right, you can clearly see that uh, x is not in the, in, in the denominator, it's actually in the numerator, if you plugged it in, you're going to get infinity for the numerator and infinity for the denominator. It leads us to infinity over infinity. That is not desirable, right? So what we do is, our, our, our interest is to divide the numerator, okay, by the highest power you see in the denominator. Divide every term in the numerator and the denominator by the highest power in the denominator. So I'm going to write this, give some gap. So the highest power in the denominator is this x squared, right? So that's what we're going to do. We're just going to do divide by x squared. And I'll show you shortly the big benefit that we get out of it. So what this does immediately is if you, s if you have matching x's, it helps cancel off, right? Because you are dividing up and down, the balance is preserved, so we did not affect the value of it. So that is mathematically perfect. So if you were to cancel off, this goes away, 1x from there, and here again, this goes away. So we're, we are left with 5 plus 8 over x minus 3 over x squared divided by 3 plus 2 over x squared. Now, when your x approaches infinity in your limit, this is the most desirable form for us. Why? Because if we can move the x from the top to the bottom, like in this case, we have all our x's happening in the fraction in the denominator. When we do that, we can again apply this situation. Limit of any number, doesn't matter. Anything over x where x is going to be infinity, right? When x is really, really, really large, then the fraction becomes very, very, very small, which is the same as zero. So it doesn't matter if I had a 1 on the top or 7 on the top or 10,000 on the top. All of these will give us nothing but something over 0, and that is what we desire. So when we apply it here, so 5 plus 8 over, it's uh, very uh, uh, uncomfortable for me to write the infinity there, but I had to show you that I'm basically substituting for x as infinity, right? There's no meaning to say infinity squared because infinity is so large. Okay, so it's it's uh, it's already the. It's, it's so huge. You're not by squaring it. You're not adding anything more to it. Okay. 
All right, so we know that when we when I have applied, when I say when I apply, I'm plugging in for x as infinity. We know that this becomes zero, this becomes zero, and this becomes zero. So in future, I will not be plugging it in, but I will simply write the that that expression will approach zero. This is just for us to uh, see through it um, in the terms of substitution. So all we're left with is five on the top, so five plus zero, right, basically. So five on the top and three in the bottom. So the limit for this was five over two, right? That came out really, really nice. Um, what number was this? C, so let's go to D. Limit 11x plus two over two x cubed minus one. And here x approaches negative infinity. So let's apply the same technique where the numerator is divided by, sorry, each term in the numerator should be divided by the highest power in the denominator. That over x cubed, over x cubed. I'm so sorry, this was supposed to be x cubed. I have it like that. x cubed minus one, right? Yes, two x cubed minus one. And so that's going to be x squared cubed. Something's wrong. <laughs> it's all x cubed everywhere, folks. Okay, I'm dividing it by x cubed. And then when I ca cancel off, that will be an x squared. This goes away completely. So limit x approaches negative infinity is 11 over x squared plus 2 over x cubed over 2 minus 1 over x cubed. When you apply negative infinity, we just saw previously that it doesn't matter if it is positive infinity or negative infinity because this whole thing will become zero and zero doesn't take a positive or negative value, so it really doesn't matter here. Okay. That is a zero and that will be a zero. So what we get uh, after applying the limit is zero over two minus, okay, I'll just show it to you individually, two minus zero which is basically zero. So zero is a perfectly fine number. We just got this to be um, zero. Now, um, if you think about the one over x situation, right? One over x is this rational function, right? And if you were to reason it out through the graph, we'd reasoned it out algebraically, right? We said as the, infin as, as the denominator gets really, really large, the numerator gets very, very, the fraction gets really, really small. But I'm asking you, if we were to find limit of one over x as x approaches infinity, how would you answer that? For that, you go, oops, that's the back color, so you can tell, tell, it, tell them apart, use blue. So as x approaches positive infinity, right? As we go, as, as x gets larger and larger and larger, Notice how your pink graph gets closer and closer to the x-axis, which is zero for the y value. And that's what we got. That is what it means to say that limit of one over x as x approaches infinity is zero. Likewise, if you go in the negative infinity direction, as your x gets larger and larger and larger uh, on the left side, in other words, very, very small, I should say. So as x becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, on the left, you're going very, very close to negative infinity. Look at your pink graph. Pink graph actually begins to trail close to the x-axis, uh, once again, pointing to zero. So the limit of one over x as x approaches negative infinity is also zero. Does that make sense? On the other hand, if you change the uh, root and you say, well, what if I approach zero? What if we approach zero? As you get closer and closer to zero, you see that your pink graph gets closer and closer to positive infinity. Now that's interesting because limit one over x as x approaches zero from the right, because it's uh, uh, zero is not part of the domain, so it is discontinuous. So you'll have uh, to look at the left and the right uh, uh, limits. So what limit of one over x as x approaches zero from the right actually points to a positive infinity. And likewise, if you approach zero from the left. 
the limit 1 over x, x approaches 0 from the left, you see that the pink uh, the part of the branch points downwards. So that's going to go towards negative infinity. Okay. So we have a play of uh, uh, values here. It's, it's all between 0 and infinity. But if you look at the graph, it makes it a lot more easier. That is why I recommend that when you do something algebraically, you know you're getting the exact value, always cross-check it on the graph and vice versa. If you got something on the graph, check it algebraically too because now we'll have the ability, the strength and the tools to go between these two forms between algebra and graph. So I strongly recommend that you use your graphing calculator to analyze what happens at a particular point or as uh, x approaches a particular value. Okay? So here we see that. Now uh, we've seen in algebra that this, uh, uh, you know, where, where when x approaches infinity you get a number and when uh, x approaches a number you get infinity, that play is basically your asymptotes. Okay? So these are basically your asymptotes because for 1 over x you actually have two asymptotes. You have the uh, vertical um, asymptote and the horizontal asymptote. So let me quickly define a uh, horizontal asymptote here. Horizontal. That says, with all the definition in the background, okay? So if you had a line y equals b, yeah, it's a horizontal line, so it has to be y equals b. So limit f of x as x approaches infinity will be some value b, which is the horizontal line, okay? Uh, or it could be limit f of x as x approaches negative infinity, which could be that b. And that's what we saw in the case of 1 over x, that b was a 0, basically. So when we went towards positive infinity or towards negative infinity, we got a 0. And uh, when we talk about the vertical asymptote, as vertical asymptote is present when your denominator becomes 0. So the definition for, for vertical asymptote would be the other way around. The uh, equation of a vertical line is x equals a. So then we can say limit of f of x as x approaches a from the right, say. It could be plus or minus infinity. Or limit of f of x as x approaches a from the left, like we saw, 0 from the right, 0 from the left. That could approach plus or minus infinity. And that is your vertical asymptote. So uh, if, we, uh, if we look at some examples on this, we can see that we can apply this information to, uh, to reduce our limits. So let's say we're asked to find the limit of x minus square root of x squared plus 16 as uh, x approaches infinity. Okay. You must be curious to at least go back and check those on your calculator. But at this point, we are going to use uh, algebra to overcome this. What you see is, if I directly apply infinity, right, the whole thing becomes infinity. And what we've seen is that when x approaches infinity, you didn't get it back in infinity, you got back a number. Likewise, in when x approaches a number, you got back an in infinity. So you don't get infinity in both places in the same uh, limit uh, expression. So that is uh, one thing for you to look out for. And so we have here... write this out limit x minus square root of x squared plus 16 as x approaches infinity now um, what we can see is the difference uh, you know infinity minus infinity is not clear so we have to use algebra what algebra technique can I use remember we did this kind of a problem before and when we had a radical the way we went about it is to multiply up and down by its conjugate so I am going to insert that conjugate here so that you can see that the conjugate of x minus root x squared plus six, 16 is x plus square root of x squared plus 16. And what you do on top, do the same in the bottom to keep the balance. 
because you cannot just insert any new term. Right? Now go ahead and multiply them out. That's going to be uh, a plus b times a minus b formats, the difference of squares. So it is so much easier if you simply did this. Instead of foiling it, you can just write it like this. Okay. Now we have limit x approaches infinity. That's going to be x squared minus x squared plus or minus 16, I should say, because it's going to be like this, right? Because the root and the square will undo each other, you know that. They will go away, thus giving us just the x squared plus 16. But that is happening in the parentheses, so this minus must be distributed. So th this is your denominator. To save a step, I'm going to drop the parentheses here, but change the sign here to a minus. Okay? You can always rewind and see what I did there. So the I distributed the minus to the parentheses, and therefore... I'm dropping them after I have distributed. So the x squared will get cancelled off. And uh, we are left with negative 16. So limit x approaches infinity. Negative 16 over x plus square root of x squared plus 16. So what we want to do here is we want to divide the numerator and the denominator by the highest degree, which is x. Okay. So limit x approaches infinity, negative 16 over. Now this requires uh, strong algebra skills in the sense that you are able to see how to manipulate the problem. Okay. Now the purpose of uh, doing this is, of course, the x's cancel off, and then you get this x in the top, so that when you apply x um, for inf infinity for x, that tra expression becomes zero. But here you have a square root and an x. So think again about how you can al algebraically manipulate that. Now we know that this is negative 16 over x over 1 plus. W why not write this x as square root of x squared? That's possible, right? That way I can merge it with the square root uh, situation that I have there. So what I'm going to do is draw a big square root and put x squared plus 16 over x squared. Do you see that? And if we do that, the biggest advantage we have is we can separate the terms. So that's negative 16 over x over 1 plus x squared over x squared plus 16 over x squared. Because remember, the, the ultimate goal is to get all your x's in the denominator whenever you have a limit of x approaching infinity. You don't want to do this if x is approaching 0, isn't it? Because you'll get the 0 in the denominator. At that time, you want all your x's on the top. But here, the approach is to get your x's in the bottom so that the infinity will make the fraction 0. All right, so negative 16 over x, 1 plus square root of 1 plus 16 over x squared. All right. Now I'm going to apply the limit. When I apply the limit, this becomes 0, this becomes 0. So apply the limit, which can be seen in the next step. So that's going to be 0 over 1 plus square root of 1 plus 0. Which is basically 0 over 1 plus 1, right? Square root of 1 is 1. So 0 over 2, which is 0. You can go down until you feel confident that the answer is zero. Don't be in a hurry and then say two or declare it to be something else, like a half or something. You know, the numerator is a zero. So we want to make sure that the denominator is some other number, not another zero. And we get that, and then we declare that the answer is zero. Now, in your um, homework, you might see some other examples involving uh, trigonometric functions. So please uh, understand that you will need um, a strong understanding of your trig identities, so use your unit um, circle as well. Most of them are plugging in values, right? So you should know uh, when you apply the values what, uh, uh, what coordinate it will be on the unit circle. So watch out for that as well. And, uh, and so that uh, uh, winds up our lim uh, uh, the, this um, particular lecture on continuity. 
All right, class. So with that, we come to the end of our uh, uh, section on continuity. And I will uh, see you in the next video. It's, uh, it's uh, the end of Chapter 2. So with this, we are done with Chapter 2. And we had a series of topics that we covered in Chapter 2. In my next video, I will see you in Chapter 3. So thank you so much and see you soon.